Welcome to the MineLab Expert Series. Dive into the world of metal detecting with us as we tackle both its basics and intricacies, all while posing tough questions to the MineLab engineers themselves. Join us in this thrilling quest beneath the surface of metal detecting. back to the next episode of the MineLab Expert Series. Today we're talking about ground balance. So, hello everybody, uh, hello. welcome back. Um, now ground balance is something I've heard of, but never used because I don't think it's on the, on the kind of starter detector range or the te detectors that I've been using. So could you give me a description of what, what ground balance is and why maybe it's on some machines and not others? A lot of times ground balance is completely transparent to the operator. Uh, on a single frequency machine, uh, any ground balance happens in the background. Uh, on Equinox, for example, on you know, multi-IQ machine, again, it happens in the background. So for a lot of users, you don't even notice. It's only when you're in you know, sort of very extreme um, circumstances or want manual control that you start to, to go into ground balance and uh, start to use ground balance more. Uh, so most of the time, most people don't need to know. So maybe if we just start with the definition of like why we even need ground balance, and it's because there's a, a phenomenon called mineralized ground. So that's basically some grounds have particles in them that interact with the magnetic field that the metal detector makes. So those particles are slightly magnetic or interfere, interface with the coil in a magnetic way. And they're not what we want. We don't want to dig them up. We don't care about the soil. I don't think anyone heads out in the weekend to find soil. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. So you've got to make a detector that doesn't get confused by that, those magnetic particles, which we call mineralization. Uh, another term we use for this is ground noise. So the word noise gets used in metal detectors in general for anything that you actually don't want. That's not to do with the, you know, the target, the gold ring or the coin that you're looking for. Um, so I guess the next question is like, why do we have soils in some places of the world that are mineralized and others that aren't? Um, it's really to do with history and what rocks were here millions and millions of years ago. Uh, they've all since eroded and turned into soil um, and dust and whatnot that's floating around. And you've also had civilizations that have been living on that soil for you know, thousands of years. Uh, for example, like a, some of the detecting I've done in the UK, um, in Europe, if you're, if you're looking in a field and you see that sort of dark patch on the field, which could be where a Roman villa was, then you've had lots of people living in that spot over thousands of years and it's actually leached uh, sort of iron based products into the ground. Sometimes it's leaching of like rusty things. It can also be where they've had like firing bricks and you get rocks that are sort of like being changed by being fired in, a, in an oven. There's a few different ways that you get uh, mineralized content in the soil. In general, you would say that the the places you go detecting in the southern hemisphere are a bit more mineralized than the northern hemisphere but also i would say that people in the northern hemisphere don't actually realize that their grounds as mineralized as it might be and so you can sort of think that your soil has no mineralization but in reality there's always a little bit and it's always doing some funny things to the targets we've always had very good detection depth in our detectors one thing the equinox does is it uh, actually ground balances the discrimination so we've always done some ground balance, some simple ground balance on detections. So you can hear a target go beep in mineralized ground, that mineralization actually uh, disturbs the discrimination uh, determination by the detector. So you get very noisy discrimination, very noisy target IDs. Whereas with Equinox, with multi-IQ, you can start to ground balance those uh, discriminations, uh, those target IDs. Uh, and so if you've got uh, a lot of noise in your target IDs, it becomes very hard to determine exactly what you're going to dig. You end up digging up a lot of trash, uh, hoping that it's going to be a good target. And this ends up getting really annoying. You also, you lose a lot of depth in that discrimination. Uh, your discrimination is probably okay with very strong target signals, very close to the, to the surface, but at depth, you start to get these very noisy target IDs again as a, as a product of that um, ground signal. Yeah, so if a user heads out on a particular day, goes detecting, and they just are getting really frustrated digging up nothing, basically. So you dig and then it sort of disappears, or maybe you keep digging up what you think is good targets, but it turns out to be garbage. Um, there's a chance that that person should actually do a ground balance and 
and actually sort of calibrate their detector to the ground a bit more. Um, so how do we actually do that? I guess it's a little bit of metal detector theory at a very high level. Um, in previous videos we've talked about single frequency detectors and how you can discriminate different types of targets in the ground. So you can tell whether something's rusty, uh, iron, or you can tell whether it's you know, a small target or a big target that you might actually want. But also on that, that diagram there's a, uh, a segment where there's ground and what we can actually do is you can rotate the whole diagram to get rid of the ground. Um, when we do that, that adjustment, that's called balancing out the ground, or hence the term ground balance. So you really, it's quite a mathematical engineering derived term, um, but really you can just think of, uh, I'm removing the ground from the signals that I'm hearing on my detector. And that's why you still get the noisy target IDs, because you remove the, the ground signal from the audio, essentially, from the, from the detection but that ground signal still plays a significant part in the discrimination in the target IDs. I, I know I always do comparisons to audio, but is it anything to do with like reversing the phase of a signal to remove that? It, it's not quite like that. It's more, um, oh, I'm trying to think of an analogy. It's like noise cancelling headphones in a way. Yeah, that's what. Uh, so if you're in a plane and you've got your headphones on and you can hear the plane background noise, then when you enable the noise cancelling headphones, it's actually subtracting that sound that's constantly in the background. It's kind of like that. And, and certainly a pulse induction is a, is a bit closer to the, that analogy. So a, a gold, gold detector with pulse induction technology is exactly that. It's, yeah. it's like that noise cancelling. Uh, in a coin treasure machine, in a single frequency detector, it's not quite the same, but similar. The noise is still there, you just can't hear it. It's, um, it's as though it's moved to a, a sub-audible um, uh, part of the range. I remember when I started working at MindLab 12 years ago, I, I just didn't know what this term was that everyone was saying, ground balance, ground balance, what does that even mean? But balance, it just means subtract or compensate for. It's just a word that seems to have been born in the metal detection industry. Um, but yeah, as somebody coming into this fresh, that's, that's probably the, the takeaway, it's just removing something. Yeah. Multi-IQ starts to get closer to a, uh, a noise cancelling headphone model where you started to cancel out the ground noise. Uh, because you've now got multiple frequencies, you've got more information. You've got some noise-free channels and you've got some channels with lots of noise in them. So you can start doing your detection and your discrimination based on those noise-free channels. Uh, and so then you've, you've cancelled the noise right out. Uh, is that almost like having a bigger, bigger sort of bandwidth? You've got more escape, more different routes to, to, to get to gather information and data. Yes. I was on the field, field at the weekend, and uh, when you swing your detector of it, all you could hear was the ground noise. But soon as your ground balance, mm. knock the noise out, the targets, they pop through. Well, once, you, once you've erased that background noise, you can you can hear the targets in the ground. It's 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 a debatable subject. Some pe some people do it and some people don't do it. What what, what detector were you using, Paul? Equinox. With the Equinox, but it's like on the CTX where you've got, you've got you can you can do your manual ground balance, and then you've also got uh, the two functions for for the ground, and uh, coin coin and ground and. And that, and so you, you've got a lot more options. Yes. To ground, to ground balance, and find the targets you want. I'd suggest that the the first thing that a user does when they start um, thinking that they need to to do some ground balancing, is we talk about several different modes of ground balance, uh, and one of those is tracking ground balance, where the detector is tracking the ground for you. You can take some instantaneous readings of the of the ground, or you can have the detector track for you. And if you just turn on the ground tracking, the automatic ground tracking, then the detector will follow the ground for you to, to first order, and that's a, a very easy way to, to get into to ground removal. So tracking means that it's constantly adjusting every second. It's measuring what the ground's doing and then adjusting slightly. Oh my God, that's amazing. I didn't know it could do that. Uh, I, I, I thought just ground balancing was just a procedure that someone did at the start if they had a detector that could do it. But it's interesting what, um, what Paul says uh, the, obviously some people just carry on regardless and it seems like 
if you've got a good detector, it, it could be okay. But from what you were saying, Mark, um, it's going to be frustrating at points if you haven't calibrated it properly for that area, maybe, if, maybe. It's, if it is a mineralized. Unfortunately, with metal detecting, it's always, it depends. Um, so basically, most detectors offer a ground balance. So I'll, I'll touch on Vanquish a bit later, which doesn't, because multi-IQ helps it. But most detectors provide a particularly single fre frequency detectors historically. And, and usually the way the user balances to the ground is they, they hold a button down or something, put it into a mode where it does ground balance and you pump it on the ground. That collects some data and then the detector's good to go. Um, but one of the trade-offs, and this can cause problems, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, is uh, you can do a ground balance and it might actually try and compensate quite a bit for the ground. Because ground, without going into a lot of detail, the ground that you may encounter will have a particular value of how has, how um, much it needs balancing. But sometimes it'll say it needs balancing by a lot, but it's actually not very strong ground, so it's actually not causing much problem. Now the trade-off when you do a ground balance is it can make the detector quite sensitive to hitting rocks and stubble, and it makes a noise. So there's actually a trade-off that if you have too much ground balance when you've when you're running the detector, if you start nicking the surface of the ground or occasionally bumping the soil, you'll actually get it sounding like there's a target in the ground and then the user has to stop, dig that up, and they start going crazy because their detector's now just seeing de targets everywhere. But it's actually just that the ground balance angle is quite high. When I first go on the field, the first thing I do is I always do a ground balance. And if it's up, up to about 15 or 20, then I'll leave, I'll leave it in zero or auto if it's anything above that then i'll keep doing a manual but only do a small area at a time and then check it mm. you can't assume that the ground there is the same as what it is 50 yards away so that must be why the tracking mode is so good that the fact that as you move um you know as you traverse the land um it's going to be keep updating is there any sort of downside to that tracking mode um it'll still suffer from the problem i was saying so it could still be that the ground is saying I need a lot of balance and the tracker will just keep adding more and more and the detector will get noisy. Um, also lots of people have control issues in their life and they don't like something tracking in the background without them overtly <laughs> controlling it. <laughs> a lot of times the, the automatic tracker will be fine. The, there's actually a lot going on. There's a lot of physics models in, in the ground. You can start talking about the ground balance angle and the strength of the ground and the variability of the ground are three of the most common factors that you've got to allow for it. So it gets relatively complex. And so we try and simplify the model as, as much as possible. Mm. And most times the automatic modes are not too bad. Uh, it's when you start getting to those more extreme grounds or you want where you want optimum performance that you start needing to add in the extra manual layers. So do you think for, for somebody new to something like the Equinox then, the, the best option is auto or tracking to save them getting themselves all complicated and flustered and... Exactly, I, I would start not worrying about ground balance. Get out there and find some targets, dig some targets, learn the machine. Uh, and then when you get to that point, turn on tracking, uh, because that's sort of the first level. Uh, the detector will start to take care of the ground for you and you can compare the performance you're getting there with what you've learnt through uh, operating the detector without ground balance. And then once you've got that under control, then you can start to do a manual ground balance and start manually ground balancing in different locations to compare the, the performance of the detector. But it, it all happens over a, a period of time. It, there's no need to do it, you know, once you first open the box. It's like running and walking, isn't it? You, you, yeah. don't, you don't want to be running before you can walk. Because all you're going to do is you're going to get it that, that, that messed up and frustrated with yourself. Uh, you, you're going to stop enjoying doing it. Oh, exactly. I, I use the analogy of my kids driving the car when we were when we were teaching them to drive. Uh, you know, they got up to speed with the car driving an automatic. Uh, the car took care of, of all of the gear changes for them. They just learned how to drive and where to point the car, what they needed to be doing, turning on the indicators, etc. And then after that, they started changing gears uh, when all of the other the other uh, operations were automatic for them. They didn't need to think about them. Yeah, yeah. It's basically a single frequency detector. The first thing it does is decides is there something in the ground or not at all. And so we call that detection. And a ground balance is actually pretty good at enhancing 
detection and knowing that there's something there that's not ground. But then the next stage that we expect of a coin and treasure detector is for that detector to tell us what it is in the ground. So that's the discrimination bit. And what can happen is if that ground signal is getting a bit large, so where Paul was detecting on the weekend, for example, where he had to do a ground balance, then you can actually get quite a few errors coming through on a single frequency detector, like it really struggles to tell the difference between the ground and the target. And for shallow targets, it's not a problem. They're a big signal, you're going to hit that Roman coin that's only an inch below the surface. But as soon as you get like a few inches down in that kind of ground and you haven't done a ground balance, you can really start to get into some trouble. And that's actually where multi-IQ and multi-frequency detectors in general start to have a bit of an edge because they're much better at rejecting and cancer, subtracting out the ground. To the point that if you look at Vanquish, which I think is what you use, don't you, Scott? Yeah. Yeah, so Vanquish doesn't actually have the ability to set a, a ground balance, but actually the reason for that is that it's got multi-IQ running under the hood, which is the same kind of engine in Equinox, and it does a really good job of cancelling out the ground. And so you actually, on like when you do some measurements and in the real world, you'll find that you're actually getting more depth on knowing what's in the ground, so your discrimination depth is higher than you would get with a single frequency detector. And that, that can be quite confusing for people because they go, oh, Vanquish doesn't have a ground balance, my single frequency does. Machine, oh, my single frequency machine's better. But actually, uh, this is where it starts to get, you sort of have to flip things around a bit because multi-IQ is actually giving you an advantage there where you can actually see what's in the ground at greater depth with a Vanquish than you could with any single frequency machine. Right, can I just ask another question, something that you made me think about, Mark? Um, when you said about um, different depth of targets and you spoke about that Roman coin, ground balance, is it affected by the amount of ground that there actually is above a target? Yeah, in essence, yes. Um, it's probably more to do with the size of the signal from the target because the coil sees all of the ground all of the time. So it's probably less that effect and more the fact that the target's just the deeper you go, the smaller that signal gets. So to use an engineering term, the signal to noise ratio is not as good because your signal has got very small, but your ground noise has stayed the same. So the ratio is not working in your favor as a detector is trying to find that target. Oh, I've got a good metaphor. It's the equivalent of somebody whispering in a crowd and somebody shouting in a crowd. Yeah, yeah. Whispering is a small signal, shouting is a big signal. The, but the background noise of the crowd is the same. Yep. <laughs> and then if you extend that, if that person moves a little bit further away from you, they're shouting at the same level, uh, it's still the effect of the crowd that's the bigger problem than the, the, the extra distance. Mm. I like that. I'm all up for a music metaphor. And if you had your crowd, crowd cancelling headphones on, then you'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of complexity there, um, and I just hope we've given people enough that they can, can get started and understand the basics uh, of what's happening. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. It's been really good. I've learned loads again, and hopefully you have at home. Um, if you'd like to join us for the next video, we will be actually taking a deep dive into multi-IQ. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Bye.